Arnav Tripathi <laughs> from Harvard, who's going to tell us about K3 metrics and discounting. So take it away, Arnav. Thank you. There we go. Let's see. Virtual screen share now. <clears throat> All right, so thanks for the introduction and thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to tell you about this. And let me first acknowledge that this is all anything I tell you that's news joint with my collaborator, Max Zimmet. And I think you'll see that this is really an, kind of an update on a large project that we have together on the topics in the title, K3 discounts and metrics. Uh, there are many theorems that will be stated as, oh, you know, hopefully this is true, uh, just because it is a large piece of work. Uh, there are some theorems that I will be able to tell you that are already actual theorems at this point, but it seemed like there was already some interest in uh, the constructions that we're doing and getting a status update. So yeah, let's see, hopefully this will be of interest. <clears throat> so very quickly, just to establish the plan of the talk, let me say that, uh, well, okay, I guess there'll be a section zero, which is technically background, but really just setting up notation, if anything. Uh, part one will, this will really be more background, and this will be the idea of discounting potentials, or really discounting as an archetype, and here S by Z will be heavily in the background. In part two, which will be the main body of the talk, really, I'll suddenly switch topics entirely and start talking about hyperkähler quotient constructions. And finally, in part three, for however long I have to treat that, I will tell you a little bit about metrics, so to speak. We'll see what I actually mean and what I care about by the time that we get there. So, right, uh, I have chat open, I'm able to see it. So if you ever have any questions, if you wanna slow me down, just in case I start going too fast, sometimes I do, absolutely please talk in chat or absolutely unmute yourself and just tell me. Okay, <clears throat> so, I want to tell you about K3, so I better just make sure we're all on the same page first and tell you what a K3 is. Let me actually start by defining a hyperkähler manifold. So a hyperkähler manifold of dimension, real dimension 4n will be for me a Romanian manifold, <coughs> i.e. a smooth manifold together with Romanian metric G with holonomy group SPN. If you want, you could take this to be the reduced holonomy group. If you want, you could take it to be holonomy group inside there, so you can include examples like Tori as hyperkähler manifolds. This won't matter very much for me. So that's one definition, and you might recognize this as analogous to defining a Kähler manifold as a Romanian manifold with holonomy inside U of N, which is fair, but not the usual way that people might define it. So Instead, let me just remark that if you think about which tensors are preserved under the holonomy map, you find that equivalently, uh, well, okay, a bunch of remarks about this remark. If this is true, the Romanian metric G, the G, fine, the G is automatically Ricci flat. <clears throat> so it satisfies some interesting nonlinear partial differential equation that's attracted some attention. Uh, but more to the point for our purposes right now, you find that in particular, this manifold is Kähler in the sense that it admits some compatible complex structures. And not only does it admit complex structures, it admits three uh, almost compl well, complex structures, let's say integrable, <coughs> almost complex structures. often noted I, J, and K, such that the span of these guys together with the identity uh, comprise the quaternion. So they satisfy some relations, I squared, J squared, K squared is all minus one, of course, but also I, J equals K and so on and so forth. And then if this is true, you'll find that for any uh, pure imaginary quaternion of norm one, your imaginary unit quaternion, zeta in what's termed the twister sphere, but so I might write it as S2 or equivalently uh, guys in the linear combination of IJK of form one, 
this also yields uh, all integrable almost complex structure, a Kähler structure. So this symplectic form, omega zeta, and an integrable almost complex structure, j of zeta. So that very quickly for me is a hyperkähler manifold. And then the K3 manifold is, I think by the definition that I used here, the unique example of a hyperkähler manifold of dimension four. Okay, so that was the background, that was notation, really. Uh, maybe I'll just make one more remark about general hyperkähler structures. So, right, I'll frequently refer to these Kähler forms, these symplectic forms, uh, maybe these complex structures, I'm not sure they'll come up so much. Uh, let me just comment, again, uh, I should have put this up there, but all right, thanks. <laughs> uh, let me just comment that if I know uh, all of this information, for example, just the symplectic forms, the Kähler forms, everywhere on my twister sphere, that's really equivalent to knowing all of the information. So here's just an example of an identity that's true in this whole quaternionic yoga. Uh, the Ramanian metric itself is, let's use the differential geometers notations, Einstein notation. Uh, this is equal to some combination of these three Kähler forms at the three kind of poles of the twister sphere. If I'm not misremembering, I think this is true where I'm gonna to try to get all my indices correct. So let's say I, uh, K, these are gonna have upper indices and then these are gonna have lower indices. And I think this might be literally true. So, okay, all that goes to say is that a hyperkähler manifold it really comes equipped with a whole package of structure. It comes equipped with this Ramanian metric. It comes equipped with this family of Kähler symplectic forms. It comes equipped with this family of integrable almost complex structures. But for example, just if I know this everywhere on my twister sphere, then that's enough to recover the metric. And you can imagine enough to recover all of this stuff as well. So when I say in this talk, and I'll just go back up here and say, when I say that I'm ever studying the metric on a manifold, what I really mean is that I'm going to be studying the family of Kähler forms everywhere on the twister sphere for some hyperkähler manifold in this talk from K3. All right, I'll pause for questions, scroll through the faces. The faces look pretty happy. Very good. Part one. So this is really all about the Stromagy Yao's Aslo program and I think this audience in particular is heavily sophisticated with respect to that. And I'll, again, okay. And I'll again, only introduce kind of the briefest notions, the archetype of what I need to motivate the rest of the talk. Okay, so suppose, that wasn't a question, right? That, that wasn't a question that someone Suppose, uh, just for simplicity, I start with an elliptic K3 surface, where what this means is that in some complex structure, my K3 manifold, which is a real four, fourfold or complex surface, is fibered. Um, I'm going to draw this badly, but okay. It's fibered over some base P1, where the general fibers are elliptic curves. And generically, at least, you can go ahead and suppose this as well. I've got 24 singular fibers, 24 nodal P1s. Let's denote this map by pi. Then there's this great thing we can do. Uh, then in a hyperkähler rotation of this complex structure, i.e. I have one complex structure, one point on the twister sphere. If I take any orthogonal point on the twister sphere, then this is all motivation, so it doesn't really matter if you understand precisely what I'm saying. But for any hyperkähler rotation of the structure, this K3 is fibered by Lagrangian tori, a special Lagrangian tori. And we can count these open J holomorphic curves. I'm only interested in gene is zero here, so open to J-holomorphic disks with boundary, let's prescribe Maslow index, but with boundary on these special Lagrangian tori fibers. Uh, 
So one expects that to produce a whole list of, all right, so one expects that to produce a whole list of numbers that I'm going to denote as omega gamma of u. Uh, I'll roughly refer to these as open gene of zero gromov witten invariants. Shortly, I'll tell you that that's not quite what I mean. But this should be a whole list of enumerative in invariants where, let me tell you the notation a little bit. Uh, right, so expect list of numbers where gamma is inside. So this is going to be the cohomology class of my disk that I'm trying to consider. So what's the picture? The picture is that I'm trying to count the numbers from J homomorphic disks that look kind of like this. Uh, they have boundary along the storage fibers. Okay, now I'm gonna draw kind of a complex picture suddenly. The cohomology classes of these guys lie in the relative cohomology of K3 with respect to some uh, special Lagrangian torus fiber. It depends a little bit which special Lagrangian torus fiber I care about. So let's suppose that I have my point U in the base. Let's consider pi inverse of U, integral coefficients. So this guy is some particular lattice that I care about of cohomology classes in which I can count uh, these enumerative invariants. And right, so gamma's inside here, use a point in my base, but okay, let me go ahead and make sure that I throw away the generically 24 singular points. Okay, so once again, I'm just setting up a story that I'm pretty sure you've seen before, probably much greater generality. Uh, yeah, I can set up something like this and get a whole bunch of invariants. And then why am I bringing this up? What's the reason to care about this? The reason is that as a lot of people tell us, Traumadry, I was asked though, probably originally, but now the words usually associated to this are Rose Ebert and <laughs> can say which little than a lot of people. Uh, we expect that if we had good control over these invariants, if we knew how to compute these in some sense, or if we knew something about them, then we could arrange these into some algebra to expect that algebra and glue those together in some way to construct the mirror. And so again, this is motivation, that's why Z asked motivation lying in the background, is that knowing these invariants, these omega gamma of U's, allows one to construct the mirror. And when I say construct the mirror, as what? Well, I'm studying a side type invariants here. So when I say construct the mirror, I mean construct the mirror as a complex manifold. That's the story that we usually hear from SYZ grows Ebert type stories. But you might expect, and I'm not gonna to try to push this too strongly here. Uh, I'll just say you might expect that in this hyperkähler situation, expect that in this hyperkähler situation, since we have such an incredible degree of control over all of these different symplectic forms and complex structures uh, playing with each other, perhaps you might be able to re uh, reconstruct more. Perhaps you can reconstruct more. And you might, you might as well be optimistic and hope for the full metric. And again, when I say the metric, I really mean this whole package of the metric together with the Kähler forms everywhere on the twister sphere, the uh, holomorphic symplectic form that I didn't even introduce, but uh, everywhere on the twister sphere, the complex structures everywhere on the twister sphere, i.e. the full package. Certainly, if you were SYZ themselves, well, um, I haven't actually talked to Z about this, so I don't know. Um, but and okay, who knows what S's motivations were, but Yao, at least at the time, he was a real differential geometer, um, he still is. And he really thought about the constructions that he was doing as constructing the, the moduli of some, you know, dual Lagrangian torus on one side and just a point on the other side and seeing this point move around as compared to this torus moving around. That was the original picture of that. Again, you've almost certainly seen before. And when, when he was thinking about that, he really wanted to reconstruct the mirror as an actual honest Ramanian manifold as a metric space. Uh, and indeed, as a whole series of corrections to some approximations, some kind of semi-flat approximation that I'll bring up in a second. So this should very much have been the hope originally. Um, 
in this hyperkähler situation, there might be some reason to think that there is a possibility for this. So, okay, there's some reason for optimism. On the counter side, uh, some reason for pessimism might be, I'm telling you that you can reconstruct the full metric. That's kind of insane. Because like I said, if you could reconstruct the full metric, you, you have an example, at least of this Ricci flat metric. And something that's lurking in the background of my talk is that we know tons of examples of compact Kähler manifolds where Ricci flat metrics exist by Yao's theorem. They exist whenever your Kähler manifold has trivial first term class. And yet we can't write down a single example on a non-toroidal Kähler manifold. So that's you know, a real hard barrier that's kind of lurking in the background of this talk. And you should therefore have a great deal of skepticism when I tell you something like this. Nonetheless, let me attempt to tell you a story uh, that at the, for starters, I'll, it'll just be purely conjectural, I'll just state a conjecture and that'll motivate the rest of the, my talk. Okay. So first of all, right, I meant to write this before, but okay. So really quick definition. In the setup above an elliptic K3, define gamma U to be this lattice that depends on a base point U, uh, this particular lattice, uh, sorry, H2 K3 rel I inverse the point little U in the base with the fibers. This will be a local system on this base P1 minus whatever your singular points are in general, let's say 24 singular points. Uh, we have an interesting homomorphism from gamma u to c from this local system to the trivial local system. It is given by, if I have some class inside here, I'll map it to, and this will just be a little bit annoying to write, but uh, right, forgive me for the notational hazard that I'm about to get myself into. I'm going to write this. Right, so I apologize. Uh, by this, I mean some choice. Let's suppose that I picked a choice of the holomorphic to zero volume form on my K3 in the complex structure in which the K3 is elliptically fibered. Uh, right, so I'm apologizing just because I'm already using this notation capital omega for these counts up here. So uh, this is a little bit awful what I'm doing, but it is standard notation. I don't, I don't totally know how to get around it. I won't really use this notation afterwards, so I don't think it'll matter. Uh, I, I wanted to make another remark, uh, which is why is this even well-defined? Maybe this is bread and butter to you at this point, but it looks a little odd to me at first glance. I'm trying to pair some guy in relative cohomology against, well, I mean, this, okay, this guy, well, he's at least in absolute cohomology, so that's fine. And the point is just that observe that omega restricted to any one of these singular fibers is zero because it would be a two zero form on a curve, on an algebraic curve. So that's why this is at least well-defined. Okay, so first, uh, right, so this is just setup that I'll need to actually state what I expect about this list of counts. Let me already state this as a conjecture. So conjecture, I want there to ex exist as above some set of numbers, omega, gamma of u. Uh, these are expected to be integers. Uh, and this will be a slightly resummed version. This is not precise, but it doesn't really matter for me that it's precise. A slightly resummed version of the open gene of zero gram of hidden invariance that depend on a class in this relative cohomology and a point in the base that all cross appropriately. And this, I apologize, is also going to be, I'm not going to spell it out. I wrote it out in my notes and then I decided it would just not come across well in a talk. But let me at least tell you that, uh, right. So these numbers, i.e. these numbers, omega gamma of u, are just locally constant. as functions of u in the base, and they have jumps, the discontinuities, right, for points, they have discontinuities exactly at these real co-dimension one walls, 
So let's say that I have a wall defined by two classes, gamma one and gamma two. If Z gamma one of U is parallel to Z gamma two of U, where I need to define a couple of things, right? So this is as a subset of the same space. Let me just denote B by the space here. Uh, real quick definition, two complex numbers are parallel if they have the same phase, let's say Z1 and Z2 are parallel if Z1 over Z2 is an R plus. And then, yeah, when we have two uh, cohomology classes, gamma one and gamma two, that aren't multiples of each other in the, in the local system, the cohomology lattice itself, then Again, as you've probably seen before, you expect to have discontinuities in these counts. There's, uh, it's, it's kind of, yeah, on, on one side of the, this real co-dimension one wall inside B, uh, we have some counts. And on the other side, you might have different counts where suddenly you produce new counts with, uh, with cohomology class gamma one plus gamma two, or more generally random linear combinations of gamma one and gamma two. Yes, probably. Uh, good, thank you. Let's make this. Uh, sorry, just one second. Um, I want my boundary map to go from here to H1 of the torus. Uh, yeah, good. That works for homology, not cohomology. Thank you. Absolutely. Right, so we expect there to be discontinuities. And when I say wall cross appropriately, I mean satisfying the Kinsevich Slogelman wall crossing formula that I thought I might write down. And then if you haven't seen it before, it would just be far too much. But there are some explicit formulas for how these guys should wall cross. Okay, I say this is a conjecture, but most of this, I believe, has been done in work of Yushan Lin. In fact, maybe this is entirely a theorem due to Yushan Lin. Uh, the only reason I don't want to commit is I haven't thought carefully about when you resum if you still have integers versus anything else, uh, but that won't matter very much for me. So Yushan has defined versions of these counts in a, a lot of different ways, actually. Uh, he has one approach which is completely tropical. He has another approach which uses the Marvin Carton structure of the A-infinity uh, categorified guy categories that are in the picture here. Uh, he's shown that those agree. He's shown that there's wall crossing for them. He's shown much more as well. He's shown uh, higher genus versions of all of these, which I don't need for my story right now. I'm, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure if he's in the talk. Maybe you can just tell me. I'm not sure if he's shown that these tropical definitions and these more carton type definitions agree with how you might directly try to define open bromo witten invariants using, uh, for example, work of Jake Solomon and Sarah Tukaczynski. So, I, I'm not sure that you've shown that every single thing that could be shown has been shown here, uh, but it doesn't matter for, uh, I personally just need the fact that there exists some integers that wall cross in this way. So if you, if you define them tropically, that's fine for me. Right, so you, you expect these things. And then as we heard many times in our lives, if you have these numbers that wall cross appropriately, you expect to be able to take spec of some algebras with uh, privileged bases of theta functions and so forth and glue them together to get the net mirror. I'm going to try to tell you something stronger. So, this is this famous conjecture of Adam Wernicke. And then I'll comment on this in a second, which is that in the situation above, in the situation above, uh, one expects well, one has allomorphic functions, script x gamma of zeta, allomorphic in the twister structure defined by zeta that satisfy the following inequality. They're equal to some uh, semi-flat guess. I won't write this out for you now, but there's some explicit thing. Times some correction factor times exponential of negative one over four pi i, sum over gamma in this lattice, uh, gamma prime, I guess, in this lattice of, uh, right, this counts times, 
let me try to get the sign right. This pairing of some whole thing. Uh, this is an integral in a twistral space of where zeta is parallel to z gamma of u of some explicit thing, b zeta prime over zeta prime, zeta prime plus zeta over zeta prime plus zeta, log one minus script x of zeta. I got this right. I think there's one more parentheses, uh, some number of parentheses. One has holomorphic functions satisfying this identity that moreover are uh, prescribed by iterating the above integral equation starting from the uh, zeroth order guess. of x gamma semi-flat of zeta. So this is some explicit function that I could write down for you um, and that I won't. The point, uh, so there's a little bit more to this conjecture as well. Um, and these functions are essentially holomorphic Darboux coordinates in the sense that d log x1 zeta wedge d log x2 zeta are the symplectic forms, are the Cato forms, omega of zeta. Okay, so there's a lot to say here. Uh, again, to avoid spending more than half the talk on this background section, let me very quickly say that this in intense integral identity that I've written down is really the solution to a Riemann Hilbert problem. That whatever's going on here with all these logs and all of this. At first blush, you should think that, well, I've got some local system. I'm trying to write down, uh, say, flat sections of the flat bundle that's associated to this local system. And we know how to do this. Uh, for example, in this simple example of picard lushitz monodromy 1101, we know that uh, flat sections of the associated local bundle should be something like one and log z. So you continue with that idea, you generalize that a little bit, and you discover that maybe for some reason you discover that you want some functions that not only monodromy around as gamma varies according to the local system, you know how that's going to work, but these guys also are going to wall cross exactly kind of at these points right here. If you demand both of these things, both the monodromization and some kind of wall crossing, so you should think of this as an irregular local system, if you like, you find that these functions must satisfy some explicit identity and this is the identity that they satisfy. The point of this conjecture uh, and the extent to which this is a conjecture is, well, if you write down this identity, you have some approximate guess that I'm not going to write down for you. Well, as usual, when you try to solve anything by some Bach contraction mapping principle idea, you just start with that guy, you plug it into the right-hand side, uh, you iterate it, you get a first order approximation, you plug that back in, you keep going. And that's what I mean by this stuff down here. I mean that for uh, sufficiently nice elliptic K3s, you expect that iteration procedure to converge. Once that happens, I'm telling you that these explicit functions that you provided actually give you the Kähler forms. And the extent to which this is a conjecture is actually not very conjectural. If these numbers, capital omega, satisfy the wall crossing identities that I alluded to above, uh, then in fact, it's automatic that these give you uh, Kähler forms and that they satisfy you know, for different zetas, the quaternionic identities, all that sort of stuff. That's all automatic. The real meat of this conjecture is just that this iteration procedure converges. That's all that you really need. That's the extent to which this is a conjecture. So the real meat of this conjecture, what this is honestly actually saying is just that these numbers don't grow too quickly. Uh, that's the thing that'll govern whether this iteration procedure converges or not. And right, Gaiotto Mornitsky in 2008 and 2009 wrote a series of papers uh, outlining this idea for the case of Hitchin systems as an interesting example of a non-compact hypercalar manifold. And the reason why I'm writing this is not so much to take credit in myself, but to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Max Zimmon and Sharma Kachru, for noting that the same should be true for K3 as an example of a compact hypercalar manifold. Uh, yeah, hypercalar manifold to which the same, same should apply. Uh, maybe purely mathematically, this doesn't surprise you very much. You say, well, maybe K3s are kind of the same as Hitchin systems. I don't know if you think that, but 
uh, they gave you know some very interesting context for why you should believe that considerations should still converge. I don't know if can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, where does the right hand side of that equation come from? Good. So the right hand side comes from the expectation that you should have some functions that themselves satisfy some Riemann Hilbert, irregular Riemann Hilbert type problem. So this integral equation doesn't just come out of thin air. It comes from the expectation that we want some solution, some functions, x gamma, that themselves satisfy some law crossing relation. You may then ask, well, what the heck are these functions? Why should they exist? And why did you know to look for them? And let me just cryptically say right now, and I can say more at the end of the talk if you uh, want to ask more, that the reason people knew to look for these functions was by thinking about the quantization of the K3, the, this holomorphic symplectic structure you could try to quantize to an actual non-commutative algebra. Uh, there is some expectation for functions that should quantize appropriately, and you think about what kind of wall crossing they would need to satisfy, and you come up with this as the Riemann Hilbert problem that they need to satisfy. So much like with the, sorry, go ahead. I, I just said thanks for that explanation. Okay, so this all being said, this is absolutely my motivation. And now I'll just say goal, compute these numbers. Actually try to compute these slightly resound version of these open gram written invariants. This is an insane goal uh, for several reasons. One is that, like I said, if you could do that, well, now you can see that I've, I've given you this explicit conjecture if you're able to compute these, all you need to check is something about the growth rate, which is one expects to be true. And then it'll just follow that you have these forms and you're able to produce these Kähler forms. And then it's immediate to produce the honest actual metric. You would have a formula for a non-trivial Ricci flat metric. That would be huge. So you should already believe that this is very difficult for that reason. Here's another reason. If you think about uh, these numbers, these, these numbers could be set up purely as a combinatorial problem. If I just scroll up a little bit to this conjecture up here, I said that there exists some uh, numbers, some integers that wall cross appropriately, i.e. that's, um, yeah, that, that have prescribed jumping behavior as we cross these walls. There are probably unique solutions to this problem if you set some initial conditions. I think this is what the argument in the last section of that can say of, sorry, I forgot to cite something. Uh, my apologies. Right. So. I need to cite some people now. So this essential approach to trying to study these uh, omega gamma views, I don't think to compute necessarily the full metric, but certainly starting as an example of the whole gross Ebert program to compute the mirror. Precisely this example was studied in a paper in 2004 by Kinsevich Sotelman, where they used non-Archimedean technology. And really, uh, they don't even cite this, but I think this goes back earlier to a paper by Fukaya in the early 2000s, maybe, or two, which was a bit more analytic. But OK, uh, the ideas were already there. Sorry, so as I was saying, I believe the argument of the last section of this paper maybe tells you that you expect a unique solution to this wall crossing problem. I find it a little hard to extract um, sharp statements from conservative soil and paper sometimes, but I think that's the point. So you could set this up as a purely combinatorial problem, hand it to a combinatorialist, and then they'll refuse to work on it because it's very, very difficult. Uh, if you scroll up here a little bit and think about the kinds of walls that are going on in this space, these there are an intense number of these walls. They're dense uh, inside the base P1 minus 24 points. So you have this dense wall crossing going on constantly. And even if you could start with the knowledge of the left hit symbol and being able to start with some ones at some point and then just start doing the wall crossing formula and going to some other point in the base and trying to find the numbers there and just keeping on going, it, it'll get out of control uh, very quickly. So I think in some sense, Grosebert, you know, their program has basically worked for K3s. They tell you that these numbers exist, that they satisfy whatever identities they need to satisfy so that you can take spec and produce some numbers, but we don't know what these numbers are. This is intense and it's reasonably intense. Okay, that being said, I'm now going to switch gears entirely and tell you about something completely different. Or two. I'm going to pause uh, just for a second. I think, again, everyone's probably reasonably happy uh, in that you've seen at least the flavors of this idea before, but okay. 
Perpendicular functions. Okay, let's recall that if I have a compact Lie group, a Lie group G acting on a symplectic manifold and omega, I can take a symplectic quotient, Marsden Weinstein, Weinstein symplectic quotient. In particular, if I suppose that this group acts in a Hamiltonian way so that I have a moment map to the dual Lie algebra, then this thing, which we often denote as M on G, is defined as mu inverse of zero divided by G, provided that zero is a regular value for this moment map. And this is a nice manifold, or at least orbifold or something. Okay, you can define this. This is a fine construction, great. Uh, in the setting of a hypercalar manifold, if I have G acting on a hypercalar manifold in some tri holomorphic way, so hypercalar, by which I just mean I'm really thinking of this whole package of omega zetas, then I actually get some triple of moment maps, which I'll just continue writing as mu to G cubed. And if I put a whole bunch more slashes, I don't know how many slashes you like, I could do something like this. And this guy is again a hypercalar manifold. Again, in good situations where zero is a regular value. Um, this construction is uh, due to Hitchin, Carl Hede, Lindstrom, and Rochek. It's like a quotient from Marston and Weinstein. So, this is a nice way to produce hypercalar manifolds. And there's a little bit more than you can do. So, let me just very quickly say that if G has U1 factors, And more, uh, more professionally, maybe I'll say that if the center of the Lie algebra, uh, sorry, if the universal, yeah, right, if the center of the Lie algebra is non-trivial, I'm trying to think. If that's what I mean. No, sorry. I, that that's well. Okay, I could write it like that, but that's kind of a silly way to write it. Let me write it like this. It's non-trivial, then in fact I could pick some C inside here, and I don't have to just take mu inverse of zero, I could take mu inverse of C. So in general, I'll call this space uh, frag G, or really it should be frag G dual of G, uh, the space of moment map deformations, and maybe I'll denote this by a little C here, and so I can take a little C here. Uh, I would have this whole family of hypercalar manifolds produced by the space of moment map deformations. Okay, that's fine. Pretty construction, whatever. So Kronheimer gave kind of a nice example of a lot of these. Uh, this was in the mid eighties, I think, late eighties. So he gave the construction of a lot of examples of ALE manifolds. It doesn't matter if you've seen these before. No. These guys as hypercalar quotients. And this started with the following idea. He said that whenever you have a finite subgroup acting on C2, preserving all of its hypercalar structure, uh, what this really means is that gamma is a finite subgroup of SU2. Here's just a cool example of a manifold in a group such that the group acts on this manifold in tri Hamiltonian fashion. So let's just define, I'll use A for ambient space now. Uh, actually, let me define my group first. So I'll define my group to be. Uh, Right, it's going to be a subgroup of unitary matrices on the regular representation of gamma. And inside there, I have gamma acting on the regular representation of gamma unitarily. So I could consider the centralizer of this subgroup, gamma sitting inside here. Okay, fine, that's a thing I could do. And similarly here, uh, I could take A to be, I'm just making a definition, nobody can Stop me, this is fine. I can just define this to be something like a Lie algebraic version of the above. So take unitary matrices on the regular representation of gamma, tensored up with C2, or sometimes, uh, sorry, sometimes it's more convenient to write this like this. I'll usually use this notation rather. Uh, this is a hypercalar manifold. Uh, it's just induced essentially from the hypercalar structure of C2. And the claim is that there's a natural action which you can essentially just kind of guess by looking at it. 
of G on this group A, it's tri-Hamiltonian. And if you try to take this hypercalar quotient construction, you find that there's a whole space of Bowman map parameters. And a claim that I'm not going to state more precisely here, but this is this theorem due to Ronheimer, is that this is an interesting family of real fourfolds, no fourfold hypercalar manifolds. Okay, so that's fine. And in particular, uh, I'm not, I don't think this is necessarily clear until you go through the linear algebra a little bit more, but this deforms when C equals zero. This is no longer a hypercalar manifold, but it is a singular or hypercalar orbifold if you want. This turns into just a flat quotient of C2 mod gamma for the original action of gamma on C2 that we had before. Okay, that's fine. So Hitchin in his survey on hypercalar manifolds asked in um, 92 or so, if there are other nice examples of manifolds that you can produce in this way, in particular, he wondered, can you produce K3s as hypercalar quotients? Well, okay, that's um, tautological, of course, because you would just take it as K3 mod, the trivial group. Uh, what, what would be interesting and what's usually more convenient to work with is if you know something nice about the ambient space that you start with, in particular if it's a vector space A. So as hypercalar quotients of some uh, affine space, hypercalar affine space. And in fact, you'll need to take this affine space to be infinite dimensional. Uh, you already do that just fine. It's, it's kind of a fun exercise to see that you can't possibly produce a, this compact hypercalar K3 is a hypercalar quotient of a finite dimensional affine space. It's, if you want to think about it, you should feel free. It's, it's kind of cute if you don't already know it. It's very similar to the argument that compact Calabi-Aus can't, can't admit killing vector fields unless you're just splitting off S1 factors. Um, yeah, it follows from some Weizenbach type that so can you produce this as a hypercalar quotient of some infinite dimensional affine space? And right, what I'm gonna to try to tell you is that the answer is yes, and I'll tell you how to do so. And at the end of the talk, hopefully I'll tie this back to what this has to do with part one and why I think this is an interesting approach to something. So first, let me just say a bit naively the idea. There are some interesting points in K3 moduli space where if I take an abelian surface, um, a four torus, a T4, and I quotient that by say, the Z mod two action, which just takes X to minus X, T4 is a, has a group structure. Then this is an example of a singular K3, where what that means is that I have some moduli space of K3s and at some point as I approach the boundary, I get to something like this in very much the same way as whatever Kronheimer's interesting smooth manifolds approach to this C2 mod gamma. So maybe you say, okay, let me try to write this as C2 mod gamma. Um, hmm. Well, okay, so T4 itself is C2 mod Z4. So this kind of looks like C2 mod Z4, uh, it's going to be a semi-direct. Uh, let's see which way, I think it's semi-direct in this way. So I could write this as C2 mod Z4 uh, semi-direct is M1 two. And the idea is to repeat on Heimer's construction for this thing. So maybe we'll just denote this as gamma hat and I'll write this as H1 of the T, well, H lower one of the T4 with Z coefficients semi-direct, some finite sub group that's acting. Okay, apply on construction to C2 mod gamma hat. So, okay, I mean, I could just copy paste this and see how we feel about it. Paste. A lot of hats. So I have some ambient space, which looks like this. I have some group, which looks like this. And everyone should probably be very unhappy because uh, you know, what does this mean? I'm taking unitary, like just the starting point. Let's start with the group. That's usually easier. 
and taking unitary matrices on this extremely infinite dimensional space. Uh, so what's happening? So if you're the sort of person who, uh, you know, just like talking and seeing results, whatever, your eyes tend to glaze over a little bit and I can certainly empathize, you might want to tune back in for this because this actually is very fun and kind of a fun example that I think is going to elucidate what's going on here. Let's consider the example of gamma hat, one of these interesting, very infinite discrete groups, but not that bad. Let's just consider gamma hat equals Z, so to speak. So let me try to understand U of a matrix, which is count of a vector space, which is countably dimensional, countably infinite dimensional, let me just write U of infinity. So just schematically, I've got my infinite by infinite matrix of you know, a sub ij, where i and j are both integers. And okay, that, fine, maybe I impose some unitary condition that transposes equal to its inverse. And then I ask for something that commutes with the action of z inside here, or equivalently commutes with the action of uh, the generator of z. What it means for this infinite by infinite matrix to commute with the action of z, i.e. to commute with what's essentially the shift operator, the, the matrix with all ones along the subdiagonal or super diagonal, is that a column of this matrix, let's say a0, a minus one, a1, a2, a minus two, is related to the next column just by being shifted down by one. That's what it's gonna to mean to commute. So this is a0, a1, a minus one. And it keeps going like this. So my unitary matrices have this structure and I claim that in this case, Z of Z inside U of RZ If you play around with this a little bit, this you can naturally identify with L U1, i.e. this is my notation for which maps from S1 to U1. So this is a very pretty example of uh, just Fourier transforming. And I, I encourage you to try it because it's actually fun to see how this works. Like, yeah, see that this collection of stuff, well, okay, this is not so surprising. The, the datum of such a matrix is just a column like this. Uh, a column like this, uh, you can think of it as a whole bunch of Fourier modes uh, that are valued inside. So it's some math from S1 to just C a priori. And then you can check that the unitarity constraint is going to demand that you actually land inside U of one. So this is fun. If, if you've ever wondered kind of if there's a Fourier dual presentation of this guy, it's, it's something like this in terms of these infinite by infinite matrices. If you're trying to be rigorous mathematicians, you should be a little bit unhappy now because you know what is U of infinity? I would like to study unitary operators on some Hilbert space. Let me just say that you can take the Hilbert space to be something like little L2 of Z. And then once you go through this, you'll find that you get L2 maps from S1 to U of one. Similarly, you could take for a uh, so little spaces and so on. So this actually works and it motivates the idea of rather than taking this seriously and trying to study these very infinite matrices, let's work in some Fourier dual picture. So now I'm just going to state a theorem for you. So this theorem is still somewhat being written up in progress, but I am happy to call it a theorem. So, right, the group is going to be some kind of gauge group of maps from T4 to, well, it's going to be what U of two now. Uh, let me not comment on that, but that's not somehow so surprising. This guy, when you take the Fourier dual, you can maybe already squint your eyes and see that it looks like differential forms. In fact, since gamma hat doesn't actually act linearly on C2, in particular the Z4 part of it shifts things around, you don't actually get differential forms, you get connections. So here, let me just tell you now. Let A be the space of connections on a trivial principle SU2 bundle on T4. And I'll just claim, oh, well, okay, and G, the some sort of gauge group of maps from T4 to, I'll take SU2 rather than U2 for simplicity. And then uh, for generic C in, I claim that there'll be some interesting space of moment map deformations. The hypercalar quotient, script A mod mod, script G, 
G is a K3 surface, is a smooth K3 surface, um, manifold. I tried not to call it a surface just because I didn't want to privilege my complex geometry background, but anyway, it's a smooth K3 manifold. Okay, so this certainly answers Hitchens' questions. Um, there's more that I should have written in the theorem, like, okay, script G acts on script A, which is a hyper space, try Hamiltonian least so that this equation makes sense, but okay, let me suppress that. So let me already pause for questions, and okay, there's one theorem for you at least. Um, yeah, if I may ask, what's happening with moduli here? Good. So the moduli, uh, Right, so there's much more that I could say about this theorem, but let's try to count the moduli. So how many, I didn't state this, but I expect to be able to get all K3s in this way, which have 57 or 58 moduli, depending on how you count. So how many, so the, how many T4s are there? Well, there are nine or 10, depending on how you count. And then the rest of the moduli of the K3 are gonna be produced by these moment map deformations. So in particular, I claim that this is naturally a 16 dimensional space so that I get 48, uh, degrees of freedom of deformation in the moment map, and those give you all of the moduli of K3. Let me also Sorry, you, you, you're counting reals. You're counting real numbers? When you say some number, like 16, is that 16 real dimensions or 16 complex dimensions? I'm counting real dimensions right now. Thanks. Okay. So is, is this related to this uh, thing in algebraic geometry that if, if you look at moduli, of bundles with the right numerical data, uh, then you get all birational models as you vary the stability condition. Uh, this is very, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this is very much the same idea. Uh, there's some version of infinite dimensional GIT in the background, which is what you're alluding to, Kempfenas, or however you like to call it. Uh, you can also formulate this as a complex quotient where instead of imposing all three moment maps, you just impose the complex moment map and then quotient by a complexified version of the gauge group. And right, what I'm writing here, uh, I don't know if it's recognizable to, and, you know, most people or not, this is some space of instantons that I'm writing down because the moment maps are really uh, anti-self-dual conditions. Mm -hmm. So what I'm writing down is really some kind of space of equivariant instantons. And then as you say, uh, this can also be considered more algebra geometrically as some kind of space of equivariant sheaves uh, that's been deformed in some way. Mm. I, I certainly haven't worked all of that out. In particular, uh, you're going to get some kind of sheaves not on uh, the T4 or the T4 mod C2, but some non-commutative deformation thereof as you turn on these interesting parameters. Mm. And this is work that has been done, not in this T4 case that I find interesting, but in the P2 case, which is uh, somewhat simpler, by uh, Baranowski, Ginsburg, and Kuznetsov, in the algebra geometric context that built on differential geometric work by Crowley Bovey and Holland. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so uh, there's actually a lot more to say about this. Namely, I took one example of an interesting flat orbifold limit in K3 moduli space. There are in fact 10 of them and all 10 of them will work and give you other hypercalar quotient constructions of K3s. Uh, as Mohammed just asked, what I'm, what I'm doing when I'm counting dimensions, I'm counting real dimensions, I'm counting the moduli of K3 as a Ramanian manifold, and that moduli space is really 0319 mod uh, something mod something, uh, maybe times an extra R for scaling overall volume. So that's how I got my 57. But uh, remark, there is a way that I'm not going to describe now to also add B field and get the full 0420 that you might expect to see for the purposes of doing mirror symmetry more easily. So, great. Uh, Arnav, you need a equivariance condition on both A and G, right? Yeah, of course, thank you. <laughs> I completely forgot uh, the important thing, which is that I need to impose equivariance everywhere. So these are gonna be Zima two equivariant maps where Zima two acts by involution here and Zima two acts by conjugation by any order two element, it doesn't matter which one here. And I need to impose EMA2 equivariant connections here. Thank you. And for the C space, you need some co-centrality condition, right? Oh, uh, yeah. OK. So 
fine. That's, that's Ethereum in progress. And like I expected, I didn't really ex plan on having too much time for part three. But in a few moments, let me tell you a little bit about uh, one theorem that we can actually do. So theorem, this is again, this I actually very much feel comfortable calling a theorem. Uh, and I'll just state it, but I, I think it won't be clear what the content is or uh, why one should care and how it relates to any of the previous parts before I uh, go back and tell you more about it. Right, so first let me tell you a little bit more about the moment maps here. So the moment maps are, well, okay, it's something about a, sorry, just give me one second. Yeah, like I said, the, the moment maps are something like a, a connection A on my torus T4 gets sent to uh, the self-dual part of the curvature. Uh, right, the, the usual moment map that I'm trying to write down is some anti-self-duality condition. So I'm telling you that the self-dual part of the uh, curvature is equal to zero a priori. But once I turn on these Cs, it's no longer equal to zero. The moment map turns into the equation that the anti-self-dual part of the curvature, sorry, that the self-dual part of the curvature is actually equal to a bunch of delta functions uh, supported so some combination of delta functions supported delta distributions. Uh, I'll make a comment about that in a second. Supported at the two torsion points of T4. So you can immediately see that there's 16 such points. That's where the 16 came from. Uh, you can also see that, well, uh, it actually matters a lot that I have this dual, dual here. Usually in the finite dimensional case, there's no difference between Lee G and Lee G dual because there's a killing form. Here it actually matters a lot. Lee frac G is something like functions valued in wherever. Um, and here there's also some frac SE2 dependence that I'm not gonna tell you about. Usually Lee frac G is something like functions supported wherever, but Lee frac G dual is distributions supported wherever. Uh, so it really matters that I have that here. And right, so, this is the moment map equation that I'm trying to set, uh, solve. And the claim that I'm just going to write down quickly is there, ex there exist explicit solutions to the moment map equation, moment map equations, F self dual equals delta distribution formally in C. And the proof is really, you find a Green's function for this elliptic operator that takes a connection to, it's the self-dual part of its curvature and there's also some gauge fixing. So find a Green's function for an elliptic operator, for, an, for a linearized elliptic operator, this thing that I just wrote up there is a nonlinear partial differential equation for a, and iteratively keep applying, keep applying it to uh, the right hand side of delta. I'll start. Okay, let me make a few remarks and then I'll immediately wrap up. So I'm trying to solve these moment map equations. Uh, that's a thing that I could just decide to do. I could try to write down connections that solve this. Um, maybe that'll be interesting. So I'd like to solve this. And indeed, this is a nonlinear elliptic partial differential equation. I can find an explicit Green's function for the linearized part and then just keep applying it as usual uh, to, first of all, the delta function. I'll get an approximate solution where the linearized elliptic operator equals delta, but there's a nonlinear part because f is a nonlinear operator. So I get another right hand side, apply it again and again and again. And I get some formal series. And when I say formal series, I, I really mean some you know, formal power series in C. So the content of the theorem is essentially nothing. It's just we could find the Green's function and then we could just keep applying it and write down explicit formulas for what we get. And I could write down a couple of those and I'm not going to because I'm out of time. What this gives you is a solution to, it, it actually tells you what the connections in this space, script A minus script G are, it tells you what the actual, this K3, some moduli space of equivariant instantons, I've now solved for the actual equivariant instantons, but only formally in C. 
So there are various ways that you can make sense of this. Uh, I, if, despite what it might seem like, I'm actually an algebraic geometer. And for me, if I try to make sense of this, I would just say, well, a manifold is a locally ranked space, which is locally isomorphic to uh, an open subset of R to the N for some N. And then I could just throw in nilpotent fuzz in the same way that you could do that in complex analytic or algebraic geometry. So, okay, you can make sense of a manifold which formally, of a Ramanian space which formally deforms T form on C2 and make sense of a metric on it and forms on it. So you could get all this stuff. And at that point, once you've solved for the connection, you can go through the whole business of writing down the symplectic forms, which are now just inherited from the symplectic forms on this uh, ambient space. We've now cut out the right locus inside there. It's cut out by the moment map equations. We can actually solve for the symplectic forms. And therefore, if you wanted, get the literal actual metric. In other words, we found the literal actual deformations of the metric as a power series in these moduli, in these parameters C. So the difference between this being kind of a cheap theorem and being a very exciting theorem is exactly to what extent you can get rid of this formal name C. If it's just a formal power series in C, that's, that's fine. If it's not, then I've actually, by completely different mean, other means, provided you an actual explicit Ricci flat metric on a K3 surface. So we're trying to do this and we'll see how we do. But even without that, even if you just have this formal power series in C, once you have the metric, which I again mean the package of holomorphic semantic forms, you can go back up to part one and compare it with this conjecture. And well, I've produced these guys by some other means now. You could now compare it with this formula and try to read off this list of integers. And this is in fact going to be essentially a Fourier duality in two of the four variables. So we've done this to some extent and found good agreement with kind of low-lying terms. And yeah, this is the plan that I wanted to tell you about. We hope to keep doing this and read off more and more terms. Okay, let me stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. All right. Um, if anyone has questions for Arnoff, um, go ahead and enter them in the chat. Or you can unmute yourself. I'm, I'm fine either way, personally. I don't know. That's, that's and may, maybe I'll start off with one, actually. Um, is, is there a connection between that second theorem and the task that you mentioned earlier in the conjecture of bounding the growth rates of those numbers? Good. This is a question that's really, um, really eaten at both of us. So what we're doing here, when I tell you this part three, this theorem here is, well, we're solving some iterative equation by some bonnet correction mapping principle, and we're doing something again and again and again, and it's, it's, it is some integral equation that we're just plugging back into. And part one had some integral equation that we're just plugging back into. And it's, it's overwhelmingly tempting to say, are those formulations directly related to each other? That might allow you to more easily just read off from the structure of the integral equation, these omegas that are I can't comment on this. Um, the, my thinking on this kind of is very time dependent. It changes on the day. So I would very much like for that to be true. I can't tell you something sharp about it. The, the type of convergence seems very different in the two cases. In this part three, what we're trying to study right now is convergence in well, weighted Sobolev or really weighted the older spaces. And it feels rather different from what's going on in part one. But maybe I just don't know enough of it to understand more. I see a question from Mohammed Abu Zaid. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask whether you can now turn mirror symmetry for K3s into a statement about linear algebra. That's very much my hope. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the things that I wanted to ask this crowd. So uh, first of all, let me just ask you, when you say mirror symmetry, do you mean like classical or do you mean homological? No, I just mean the course, let's, let's ignore what, you, what can be proved. Just the statement of which K3 course, yeah. Yes. What is the mirror of a K3 with a B field? You know, what is the correspondence at my, the level of moduli? I haven't worked this out fully, but my every expectation is that in this picture that I've told you here, my parameters of my K3 come from two sources, the T4 and these, um, well, these Cs once I do this exercise of adding the B field. Uh, and I believe that you simply perform mirror symmetry on the T4 and you swap the two Cs. So right now I have a Cc and a Cr. The Cr will become complexified and I, I just swap them. There's nothing happening at the level of the Lie algebra. Could you say more about that? I don't. Was one, I mean, I know nothing about 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 um, representation theory, but I was wondering whether you're supposed to swap, you know, some Lie algebra for its Langlands dual or something like that. 
So, uh, so far we haven't seen anything like this, but so far we're, we're entirely working with type A cases. I believe there are some other cases that, that appear, but right now I'm in FRAC SU2. And this FRAC SU2, I actually suppressed this a little bit, but I could have worked with FRAC U2, FRAC PU2. Those all come up kind of naturally and I can't really tell the difference between them. Okay, thanks. Unfortunately, I can't answer that. Um, yeah, so the Riemann Hilbert problem, yeah, so there, I have two iteration schemes as I answered uh, Nate's question. The bottom one is more just like the usual nonlinear elliptic equation. That's uh, stuff that you can see in uh, Gilbert, well, whatever. Uh, this first thing, yeah, this is an interesting Riemann Hilbert problem. And unfortunately, I don't think I have this written down for you because it's again some conservative soil element type thing. Uh, I can tell you where it wall crosses. I, I want these functions x, gamma, zeta to wall cross exactly at these places where the twister variable is parallel to this uh, integral, z gamma u. Um, I'm going to completely mess it up if I try to guess what the explicit guy is. Because the way that you write it down is this thing about some plectomorphisms on some big torus and some consistency of that. I, I can't do that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe one other question. You, you're commenting on the iteration schemes. So guaranteeing convergence, do you have natural function spaces in which to formulate this? Uh, yes, for this question or for the bottom question? Either. OK, good. So down here. Uh, this is the one that I'm happier answering because this is the one that I'm actively working on because right now we have the formal series and we're trying to study convergence. Uh, I believe the right place to study convergence is going to be uh, some weighted B holder spaces in the sense of uh, Melrose's boundary calculus. So, uh, so I'm not familiar with the terminology. Could you say that one more time? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think there are two things that could work. Uh, one thing that could work and I believe is just studying convergence in weighted Zobolo spaces. I think this is, might not be so well adapted to the problem, but I think it also works. So study convergence in some weighted Zobolo space. Okay, you know what, let's get back to the weighted. Of course, you know what a Sobolov space is, um, but you know, just up here, even when I stated this, you know, first big theorem, the hybrid payload quotient theorem, I didn't tell you what regularity I was taking on the maps or the connections for that matter. And if, if you've, you know, seeing the whole Donaldson, um, you know, explosion that happened in the 90s, uh, you know that you can usually set up the problem more simply, more easily starting with these bonach Lee groups and uh, bonach manifolds, so taking them to be some regularity of Sobolev, but then in fact you can usually just take smooth as well, so smooth works for all of this, but usually you start with Sobolev, say, I spelled Sobolev wrong, say H2K for the connection and H2K plus one for the gauge. Okay, I believe the same thing is going to work down here. Uh, you'll need to rig those exponents up correctly in some nice way. Uh, but then you'll also need to in include some weighting because we've got all our functions blowing up in some crazy way near the boundary points, near the two torsion points of our T4. So this weighted Sobolev space is, well, what's a Sobolev space? It's, it's a function such that if I you know, multiply it by some big C and or you know, one plus C squared or whatever, where C is the dual variable. Oh, I, okay, I'm sorry. Sorry, C is not the same C. I really just mean some polynomial in the derivatives, so whatever. I multiply some big by some big polynomial, then I still have L2 convergence. Then I'm also going to impose some multiplying by some X, where X is a local model for the thing that vanishes at my points. Is that helpful? Yeah, I guess, I mean, is, are, are uh, spaces of measures relevant? I haven't worked with that. Um, the most I can say is uh, I'm not sure. Uh, that's not the way I'm trying to attack it, but I maybe. I haven't seen that being useful, but if, if you have a recommendation, I would love to take a look. I'll give it some thought, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can't stress enough that I'm an algebraic geometer. I got into this because I wanted to count stuff, and now I'm being forced to grapple with weighted solo spaces, so I, okay. You know, I'm, I'm a PDE person who's just interested in this overlap, so I, I've got the opposite problem. <laughs> Thanks. And Arnav, I'm sorry, I just didn't understand in that last answer, what was the weighting as you go to those two torsion points? Right, so you're going to need to pick some particular exponents here such that the convergence works well. 
I don't know the exact weighting to pick here. If, if I did, I would have stated this as a theorem, not just formally in C and been like, hey, here's an example of a Ricci flat metric. And, you know, uh, certainly you'll need to multiply at least by three because the leading order behavior of my singular connections at the points of singularity uh, go like one over y cubed or by as a local variable on my T4. I'm not sure that this is good enough to get the convergence on the nose. And I think you're going to need to do something a little bit more clever. There's, there's much more that I could, like even writing down this Green's function, there are lots of pretty things I could tell you about that. Yeah. Okay, so I don't see any more questions in chat. So let's give Arnab one more hand.